Hi, I'm Matt Needham, and this is my lecture on heat, temperature, and pressure. Let's begin here with um, understanding that heat flows from a warmer body to a cooler body always. There's some myths like heat rises. That's just not true. Warm air happens to be lighter uh, than cool air and it tends to rise. But right now if you're sitting down watching this, I guarantee that your butts are putting heat down into the seat. Um, so it's always a warmer body to a cooler body giving up the heat and that idea actually was hard for people to understand even as recently as 300 years ago and we'll be watching a video called Conquest of Cold as part of this class um, that really explains uh, heat in a, in a very basic way. Now the terms hot and cold are relative terms. They mean different things to different people. There's no true definition of hot versus cold. You can get somebody from Fairbanks, Alaska and they might think 70 degrees is pretty warm. Uh, on the other hand, someone from Manila in the Philippines might think that um, 70 degrees is kind of a cool temperature. So hot and cold, warm and cool, these are relative terms um, that don't always mean the same thing to the same person. Now when we talk about temperature, um, we generally in the United States of America deal with Fahrenheit and we express um, Fahrenheit as such. Uh, and um, we might say uh, 90 degrees is a warm day or whatever. Um, and one little trick that we have here is if we look at the whiteboard, I have 82 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 28 degrees Celsius. So if you just kind of flip the 82 to 28, so it kind of gives you a sense at least of Celsius in a normal kind of maybe outside air temperature um, to remember that. And of course, we're gonna look here at this chart. We also have the absolute scales, which we're not gonna deal um, much with. Um, but let's see here on the Celsius versus Fahrenheit, we know that water at sea level, at atmospheric pressure, boils at 212 degrees or Celsius 100 degrees. Um, and water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and freezes at zero degrees Celsius. So now we have three ways to uh, look at it. The 2882, the 212 equals 100, and the 32 equals zero. Um, there's a formula, a couple formulas um, to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius. The reality is that in the trade, we don't have to do that really that often. And if we did, there's an app for that. It can easily be found on the internet, so I'm not gonna beat you up on the math uh, on this. I'm gonna beat you up on other things, yes. Um, introduction to heat. Uh, we talked about heat traveling from a warmer body to a cooler body. And in air conditioning or refrigeration, uh, as far as when we think of cooling, it's always taking the heat from a place we don't want, intensifying it, and dumping it to a place we don't care about or is unobjectionable. Inside your house with the air conditioning, we take the heat from inside, we intensify it, and we dump it outside. And if you've ever put your hand over a condensing unit or a condenser where the warm air is coming off, you can see that's actually the heat coming out of your house, but transferred through the refrigerant and the compressor. We'll get more into that in, our, in the one of the upcoming lectures. Likewise, Right now, if you have a refrigerator at home, inside your refrigerator, it's cold, and it's taking the heat from the food and the air that gets in your refrigerator and intensifies it and dumps it out into your kitchen. Um, so it's always moving it to uh, another place that we really don't care that much about in order to achieve a temperature uh, which we desire. Now, a BTU is a British thermal unit. A British thermal unit is the amount of heat required to raise one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. So here we have about one pound of water, this bottle of water, and if this bottle of water we measure the temperature to be 70 degrees and I put my hands on it and I shake it for a minute and I raise the temperature of the water to 71, I have added one BTU to the water. Uh, some people say that if you take a little kitchen match and light it and let it burn down in three or four seconds, 
that's a BTU. It's very hot, but the whole thing is over in a couple of seconds. Likewise, if you're sitting there sedentary right now, your body is putting off about 350 degrees. I mean, I'm sorry, whoa, 350 BTUs of heat every hour. I'm standing up here, I have a spotlight on my face, I'm making uh, this video, I'm probably putting off 400 or 425 BTUs an hour. When we talk about a one ton window unit, we're taking 12,000 BTUs an hour and getting rid of it and dumping it outside. That would be 12,000 BTUs an hour or a one ton system. If you got a big five ton package unit or split system for your home, that would be taking 60,000 BTUs and dumping it outside when the unit's running all out every hour. Um, and we also, a point here, we don't want to confuse heat with temperature. Okay, heat quantity, we just talked about that, right? Like my body putting off 425 BTUs an hour, okay? However, let's say my heat intensity at this moment is 98.6 degrees under my tongue, all right? That's my heat intensity. That's how fast the molecules are moving, all right? That's my body temperature. However, if Shaquille O'Neal, Shaq comes in here and visits with us and is joking around with me, his heat intensity is the same as Matt Needham's heat intensity, 98.6. But there's a lot more of Shaq than there is of Matt. So he's probably putting off 700 or 750 BTUs an hour heat quantity. So that may help you understand the difference between heat intensity, temperature, and heat quantity in BTUs. If we have 20, uh, 10 people sitting in a classroom, um, and they're all putting off 300 BTUs, we can say there's a heat load of 3,000 BTUs an hour of heat coming from the people, okay? All of their body temperatures are about the same, the intensity is the same, okay, which we express in Fahrenheit. Now, conduction is from molecule to molecule, heat transfer. It's like your butt's putting down heat down into the seat, physically touching the seat, that is conduction. And here we have an illustration on the PowerPoint slide of somebody holding a copper rod that has a flame on it. Copper is an excellent conductor of heat, a very low specific heat, which we're going to get into, and is conducting the heat right up into this person's hand, and they're about to drop it because it's getting very hot. Okay? Conduction. Convection kind of has the word like conveyor conveyance, like we think of a conveyor belt, it's using a medium, it's using usually like air or water to transfer heat. Um, when you turn on a heating or uh, an air conditioning system, you're using the air to warm up or cool down the inside of your building and the air is the conveyance. Likewise with hydronic systems, we're using water as the medium to move heat around. Here is a baseboard heater, which you have a lot on the East Coast and up North, not so much on the West Coast. We do have some. And it's pushing the air around the room um, to heat the room, and the air is the conveyance. Now, radiant heat, a little hard to understand. It says radiant heat, heat passes air through, uh, through air. It should say space. It's really outer space that when heat passes through space or a, a vacuum, a deep vacuum like outer space, it doesn't give up any heat till it hits a solid object. Um, actually, when the sunlight comes from the sun to the earth, as it passes through our atmosphere or the air, it gives up a little bit of heat, okay? But if you're standing on the beach in the summertime um, and your back is to the sun, you know, your back can get very warm even though it is only 70 degrees outside because you're getting some of that radiant heat touching your back right from uh, the sun. So it's from one body to another body passing through space. And that's actually even happens more, more than we realize. Sometimes people might even say it's 70 in the room, I'm cold. And maybe the scenario was it was a very cold weekend, you turned the heating on in the building, but it was a long holiday weekend and the whole building was very cold, but then you warmed up the air temperature up to 70, but a lot of the objects in the room are still maybe 60, 
65, 66, 67 degrees, and the people are taking the heat from their body and radiating it to those colder objects, and they feel a little bit colder, and that is radiant heat. Kind of explains sometimes why a person may be cold at 70 or 72, uh, when you think, how can you be cold at 70 or 72? Um, so uh, we also have, again, heat from the sun passing through space. It hits the earth and gives off its um, heat. One more point about radiant heat is I always wondered about how is it possible that when I know the low temperature, let's say where I live during the day, uh, is 34 degrees and a very cold day in the winter for Southern California, how is it that I have a little bit of ice on the top of my car? Because you're taking some of the heat from the top of your car and it's going radiant heat all the way to outer space and you're getting a couple degrees of cooling, hence the ice forms. If I had my car parked under a carport, guess what? No ice will form on the roof of my car or the hood of my car. Think about it, you always see the ice on the roof of your car, on the hood of your car, but not on the sides of your car, right? And uh, at all. So radiant heat, you can also you know, transfer it the other way back to space. Okay, a lot of times we think of a radiant heater in a, in a bathroom or something like that. We have these hot coils that uh, electric uh, strip heating radiates heat into the bathroom. Not an efficient way to heat, but a lot of older homes still have this. Now, latent heat. Latent heat is involved in a change of state. We have sensible heat which is heat you can sense. You can see this is warmer than that. This is colder than that. And it can be measured with a thermometer. Sensible heat can always be measured with a thermometer, but sometimes there's heat exchange going on that can't be measured with a thermometer. Let me give you a couple of illustrations about that. If you go and you take a pot of water and you fill it up in the water 65 degrees, and you turn the fire on high on your stove, and then the water rises up to 212, all of the heat that you add up to that point when the water gets to 212 has been sensible heat. Now you leave the hot fire on high, and you keep adding heat to the water, but the temperature doesn't go up above 212, but it starts to boil and turn into steam. So all that heat that went into the water that causes it to turn into steam, to change steam, to change state, is now latent heat. And understanding latent heat, um, it's not just theory, it's, it's involved in evacuation of air conditioning refrigeration systems, um, it's involved in high efficiency condensing furnaces, understanding this, um, and it has a, uh, it's a very important concept to, uh, to grab hold of, it's not just um, theory and actually the changing of the state of the refrigerant from a liquid into a vapor and a vapor back into a liquid most of the heat exchange that occurs in an air conditioning refrigeration system is through latent heat not sensible heat and that's kind of the magic of how it works and we'll be getting into that in the next couple of, of chapters okay now latent heat of vaporization is the heat involved in going from a liquid to a vapor. So if you have a pound of water, and you got the pound of water to 212 degrees, hot potato, um, and then let's say it was at 200 degrees and you brought it to 212 degrees, that would be 12 BTUs, okay? But then to go from 212 degree water to 212 degrees steam, one pound now, 970 BTUs, you can see that, right? And you know that you can actually put a pot of water out of your tap on your stove and it'll start to bubble in 10 minutes, a big pot of water. Now, for you to boil all of that water out of the pot, so now you're burning the bottom of the pot, that could take a couple of hours if it's a big pot of water, right? So it takes a lot more heat to change the state, to make a drastic change then it does sensible heat to, to just change the temperature a little bit. And then latent heat of condensation would be removing heat from a vapor to create a liquid, okay? Latent heat of fusion is 
liquid to a solid, solid to a liquid, like we could say water to ice. How many BTUs does it take to remove from a pound of water to turn it into ice? 144 BTUs. To go from 32 degree ice, I'm sorry, to go from 32 degree water to 30, um, to go from let's say 34 degree water to 32 degree water, two BTUs, to go from 32 degree water to 32 degree ice, 144 BTUs, okay? And this, you may not be able to see this graph very well. I'm not gonna talk about it too much. I, I'll gonna go over it quickly. Um, the specific heat of water is one. That's how everything is based off of that. It takes one BTU to raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. Other things like metals have very low specific heats. They change temperature easily. Maybe a tenth of a BTU to change a pound of certain metal, one degree Fahrenheit. Ice has a specific heat of 0.5. So if we have zero degree ice, which is what the temperature is inside your freezer right now, it's not 32, it's zero, and we rise it up from zero to 32 degrees because the specific heat of ice is 0.5, we're adding 16 BTUs. To go from 32 degree ice, we talked about to turn it into 32 degree water, a pound of it, 144 BTUs. To go from 32 degree water to 212 degree water, that's 180 degrees, that's 180 BTUs because the specific heat of water is one. And then to take that pound of water and turn it into steam, 970 BTUs. Okay, so understanding this because we're going to be getting involved in the fridge or refrigerants and seeing that the great heat exchange is that magic is, is of the turning of the refrigerant from a liquid to a vapor in the evaporator and then a vapor back to a liquid in the condenser. Um, very important. Again, specific heats of different things here, water one, steam and ice is about 0.5, air is like 0.24, but a pound of air is a huge, you know, um, cubic foot of air is, is quite large, um, but the specific heat of that is 0.24. Okay. Here it's talking about sizing equipment and steel, if we had a job to heat steel. Now, a pound of steel has a specific heat of 0.116. It only takes a tenth of a BTU to change the temperature of steel one degree Fahrenheit. So if we have a job where we have to take a thousand pounds of steel and let's say bring it up from zero degrees outside in Wisconsin to 70 degrees outside, it would take 8,120 BTUs. And also understanding this, and picking different substances. Like we have in air conditioning our coils, our evaporator coils, our condenser coils, right? In the evaporator we want to absorb heat, so we make the evaporator coil out of something that conducts heat very well, which is aluminum and copper. The same thing with the condenser. We want to get rid of heat at the condenser, right? And we make it of like copper and aluminum because we want to move the heat very easily. On the other hand, a refrigerator's walls have foam high uh, spray foam insulation, R50, what have you, uh, in the walls because we don't want to gain heat through the walls of the refrigerator. We're taking something with an enormously high uh, specific heat, okay? So everything has a specific heat to it. Now pressure is defined as use uh, force over unit area, and we're going to look at an example here, where if we have 100 pounds on one square inch, we have 100 psi. If we have one pound on one square inch, we have one psi, one pound per square inch. And I'm standing here, and if I stand on one foot, I've doubled the pressure on one of my feet, okay? And let me just say this, people get very confused because we're going to get involved in atmospheric pressure and pounds per square inch gauge, PSIA and all of that. Um, 
Whenever you measure pressure in air conditioning and refrigeration, you're always going to be measuring the pressure in PSIG, which means just like your tire pressure. When your tire's flat, zero. When it's full, 35. The same thing. Now, sometimes we have to convert that into PSIA, and the only two times that I can really think that we need to do that in the trade is if some evil instructor is making you plot the Molière pressure on the diagram. And again, I'm not that evil instructor. I'm the other one. And or if you're calculating compression ratios, okay? But other than that, you can think of pressure on your gauges and how they're read uh, as PSIG or pounds per square inch gauge or just like tire pressure. So let's not be uh, confused about that. Now, this is just kind of explaining what is this atmospheric pressure. And I'll go a little bit out there now. The pressure, we call the pressure on our bodies at zero. We, fire, uh, we have a flat tire, we fill it up at 35. But really right now, the pressure on your body is 15 pounds per square inch or 14.696 pounds per square inch compared to outer space, which is a perfect vacuum, right? Because the Martians, they're very upset at us. They're like, hey, well, these arrogant earthlings, these arrogant earthlings, why do they think it's zero on earth? You know, so to appease them, we have to compare it to <laughs> outer space. Okay. Um, uh, and when we do scientific calculations like compression ratios, our math or well, your pressure on the three diagram, if we start doing any math, it doesn't work that we arbitrarily just call this zero when true zero is outer space. So that's the reason sometimes we have to convert what we think of as normal PSI pressure into PSI A. Because right now on your body you have 14.696. If you're at the ocean, if you're at the top, top of Mount Everest, you have eight pounds of pressure on your body and there's a good chance you're going to be dead soon. Okay. Now the pressure gauges, the traditional gauge manifold um, would read zero um, with the Borden tube that looks like this. And here is uh, a gauge manifold, which is the hallmark instrument of our trade. We use a lot of tools from other trades, but this is the tool that we really use a lot. And they have digital versions now, which are very good. And we have the blue gauge, and when you have just atmospheric pressure on it, it would be pointing to zero. Uh, on both gauges. The blue gauge is also known as a compound gauge because it reads pressures above and below atmosphere. It can read pressures below what you're feeling right now in a vacuum and so because it measures both it's two things it's a compound gauge. The red we call the high side gauge which we usually hook up to the high pressure side of an air conditioning or refrigeration system. Okay, Gauge manifold And that's how the inside, it bends with pressure, the Borden tube, to adjust the needle on an older type of um, gauge manifold. I, the digital ones are good. They're, they're very nice. They can deliver a baby for you or whatever. Uh, I'm kidding. But they, they're accurate and they can help you with superheat and subcooling. Uh, don't get so reliant on them or some people that they just have the gauge do superheat and subcooling when they don't really understand how it occurs. Also, these gauges are expensive. Things can happen. The batteries can die. So you should always have another set of gauges, a backup set like the traditional one I showed you with you. And I recommend of the most common tools that you use in the air conditioning refrigeration trade, if you're, you know, journeyman, have truck, will travel, always have a backup multimeter, clamp-on uh, slash multimeter, uh, pocket thermometers, gauge manifolds, screwdrivers, nut drivers like this because they're used so often um, that you don't want to be without it because things happen, they break, get lost, what, what not, okay? And then um, here's the summary. And that concludes my lecture.